Hey, up. Right, before we get started on this one, I keep getting requests to see whether I'm doing a sort of a, a spooky Christmas story or spooky ghost story this year. I put a lot of thought into this. I, you know, I only have so many sort of real life experiences to draw on. And there is a little story that I contemplated publishing last year, but we live in this world of workery and political correctness. It's a story from a different era, and I wasn't sure really how it might be received. I decided against it and published the story last year that I published. However, as I say, I've only got so many real-life experiences to draw on. So if you really want one, I'll publish that on Friday, which will be my last video of this year. But be warned, a lot of people may consider that it's a story that's in bad taste. So if you're a snowflake or a person that's easily offended, avoid watching it if it pops up on your feed. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just for entertainment. You know, the last video before Christmas in future, I may well sort of... Um, you know, use some fictional stories and intertwine them. Like I say, it's just for entertainment, so it doesn't really matter. Right, long-term report on the Royal Enfield Classic 350. This is not a technical review, because for me, motorcycling's not about technicality. It's, it's about convenience and how the machine makes you feel. What it's like to live with that kind of thing. Now, at the time of publishing, I've done about 1,700 miles on this bike. Um, I'm not sure exactly, because obviously we had that speedo issue uh, in the summer of this year. And it would seem that the mileage isn't recorded in the ECU, it's recorded in the speedo itself. So when they swapped it, it went back to zero. Now, the speedo was replaced under warranty, so I suppose we ought to discuss that first and get it out of the way. To start off with, I do all my own maintenance insofar as I can. You know, if it's something that I feel a bit out of my depth with, I would take it to a dealership to get it done. But maintenance on these bikes is fairly straightforward, and I'll touch on that in a minute, but we need to talk about the warranty. Uh, there were no issues with the fact that I do my own maintenance. Royal Enfield never even mentioned it during the warranty process. Although, towards the end of the warranty process, I did get a questionnaire through by email that I filled out, which did ask you whether you did your own maintenance or whether it was maintained at a dealership and if you answered that you did your own maintenance it asked you why you know about it whether it was about the cost of maintenance or whether it was um you know to do with the dealership being too far away from you that kind of thing so it would seem to me that the current regime at royal enfield don't have a problem with you doing your own maintenance however you should only carry out tasks that you're competent to carry out and you should always use the best quality materials keep your receipts etc just in case there is an issue but make sure that you do do it you know don't see it as an excuse for just you know allowing service intervals to fly past without doing anything about it it's not good for your wallet it's not good for your bike and it's not really fair on royal enfield if i'm honest now I've always sort of had pride with this channel in giving an honest account of how things go, uh, how products work and how they perform, etc. I have to say I was quite disappointed with the length of time that this warranty issue took to sort of go through the various processes uh, until I actually had the bike back on the road. The bike was off the road for at least two and a half months in the end. I can't remember the exact dates. It may have been nearer three months, but that's not good. One of the biggest issues was the fact that they didn't have any spare speedometers in the UK. It had to come all the way from India, and that alone took about six weeks. Now, obviously, I couldn't ride the bike during that period because it is illegal to ride a motorcycle, or any motor vehicle for that matter, on the road with a non-functioning speedometer. Royal Enfield did agree to recover the bike to get it into uh, the dealership, which was Eddie's Moto. In Tadcaster, great bunch of guys uh, they kept me up to date and informed on what was going on in fact in an attempt to expedite this warranty issue more quickly they actually bought the replacement speedo themselves and then sorted it out with Royal Enfield later on the reason being that in their experience 
um, warranty parts take longer to come through than parts that are actually purchased. Now, I'm not sure what the time differentials are between sort of ordering a part under warranty or paying for it, but obviously they thought it was worth doing it, and I thank them for that. Unfortunately, I think it took um, Royal Enfield a further week or two weeks to actually collect the bike. Eddie's Motor sorted the issue out the morning after the bike arrived with them, but then again, I think we're looking at the best part of two weeks before the bike was brought back. Now, Royal Enfield had agreed to bring the bike back, uh, but then when Eddie's Motor sort of contacted them to let them know that it was ready for collection, um, they had nothing back. In the end, again, Eddie's Motor actually paid someone to courier the bike back to me, which, uh, again, is outstanding service from them. Right, this all sounds very negative, and, you know, I've got to put my hand up and say it's not the best warranty service I've ever experienced. Now, I did know when I purchased the bike that there was this common fault with the Speedos. Um, you know, it seems to be potluck whether your bike is affected or not. A lot of people have had the bikes and done, you know, high mileage on them, never had an issue. Some, like me, uh, the Speedos failed fairly early on. So I went into it with my eyes open. I knew it was a possibility that might happen. But watching other YouTube channels that had had this issue, generally speaking, it was sorted out without a month. I wasn't expecting it to take as long as it did. And this seems to be down to a bit of sort of muddling on Royal Enfield's part. Now, in their defence... Um, they did take over the UK distribution in, I think it was January or February of this year. I don't know exactly what went on there, but it seemed to me it was very sudden and neither Moto GB or Royal Enfield were ready for it. I've got no idea why it happened, but it happened. And the stories that I'm hearing is that it caught Royal Enfield a bit on the back foot, which has caused these time delays with warranty issues. Now, I know that I'm not the only one that's been affected by this. You know, there are thousands of Royal Enfield owners that watch this channel, and a lot of them have been quite vocal about how long warranty claims have taken. Uh, my sort of account is by no means the worst. And okay, there are anecdotal uh, comments in the comments section on various videos from viewers. So, uh, you know, I can't ratify those claims, but I have heard stories of people's bikes being off the road the entire summer. But there are two things that I would like to bring to your attention. Shortly after I got the bike back, uh, a trusted source from the um, industry, not someone from Royal Enfield, got in touch with me to tell me that Royal Enfield had had a big meeting with all its UK retailers. As I say, it seems to me that the UK distribution caught Royal Enfield by surprise. They weren't ready for it. Now, clearly, retailers had been, or dealerships had been complaining to Royal Enfield about this warranty um, issue, shall we call it, uh, the length of time it was taking to get warranty issues sorted out. Royal Enfield acknowledged that, and they should, by now, if they've kept the promise, Put things in place to sort of sort this problem out now I don't actually know one way or the other whether it has been sorted out I would need to put in another warranty claim um, to test it but you know I've got nothing to claim on so the best advice I can give you is keep an eye on the various Royal Enfield forums and Facebook pages generally speaking you don't need to be a member just to sort of read what people are saying it's only if you want to make comments yourself and just look for the latest opinions on warranty claims, whether things have been sorted out or not, if you're looking to buy Royal Enfield. The other thing that I want to say is, over the past five years, I've bought a total of four Royal Enfields. I still have three of them. Uh, there was nothing wrong with the one that I got rid of. I just needed space. This is the first warranty claim I've had to put in. And the truth of the matter is... Royal Enfields don't go wrong very often. Right, next up, ease of maintenance. The caveat here, of course, is whether or not you are a competent home mechanic. Some people are, some people aren't. These bikes have been designed with uh, ease of maintenance very much in mind. 
All the products and consumables are readily available. I usually get mine from Hitchcock's Motorcycles. And at the end of the day, the choice is yours, the risk is yours, whether or not you carry it out yourself or whether you take it to a dealership. Now, if you take it to a dealership, get a rock solid price before you hand the keys over. Running a dealership isn't cheap. You know, they've got to pay for the premises, whether it's rent or a mortgage or whatever. They've got to pay staff. And hourly rates can be quite expensive, but you know, as a customer, you need to know what that service is going to cost when you drop the bike off, not when you pick it up. That's when people often get nasty surprises. What I don't understand is the inconsistency in pricing. You know, again, I get a lot of comments on this channel. Some people tell me that the price of a service has been quite reasonable, you know, well under £200, yet I've heard of people being charged well in excess of £300. I'm not going to speculate in this video the disparity between service pricing, but you know it's up to you to find out what it's going to cost before you drop the bike off with that dealer, then you get to make the decision whether that dealer is carrying the service out or not. Now the service interval shown in the book that came with my bike states that the oil change, general service and checking and adjusting if necessary of the tappet should be carried out every 6,000 miles. That's quite short by modern standards, uh, you would expect 10,000 miles with most modern motorcycles. But that is partly due to the traditional tappet setup that's employed in these bikes. Although I will say, although you should be checking them at the specified intervals, it's very rare after the first adjustment that you have to adjust them again. Now, the service schedule also says that certain things on the bike need to be checked every 3,000 miles. This is not a service as such, but again, we've had reports of some dealerships insisting that in order to maintain your warranty these bikes have to be brought in every 3,000 miles for a checkup which is costing whatever I've not actually been given an example of what that costs now my personal view is that interim check is just that it's a check over if you're reasonably competent with you know these sort of mechanics every owner should be able to do that themselves at the end of the day it amounts to not much more than a pre-ride check that you should be doing daily really or at the very least weekly. There's certainly no need for a dealership to be involved in that unless you are really clueless on the general mechanics of a motorcycle. If you are clueless, money is a problem for you. Really a Royal Enfield probably isn't for you. These bikes are designed to cope with the harsh realities of Indian roads and sometimes substandard materials like oil been available for oil changes so they have relatively short service intervals and a total of two filters at the oil change one to clean and one to replace also your tappets are a traditional lock nut tappet system which is quite time consuming bearing in mind the fact you've got to do it every 6,000 miles a shim and bucket system employed by most motorcycles is probably good for about 20,000 miles so you don't have to have it done as often but when you do it is a major job which is going to be expensive Both systems, what I'm trying to say, have the pros and cons a shim and bucket system is less user friendly for the rider to carry out generally speaking you're better off leaving that to a dealership and just foot the bill for it a traditional lock nut and tap it system however although you know there is quite a bit of work involved in actually getting to your tap it's, you've only got two valves to adjust and once you've sort of done this procedure once you can probably do the entire thing in about 30 minutes from start to finish. Now, again, this all comes down to your competence. I've made videos on how to carry out these procedures. The first time may well take you a couple of hours from start to finish, but once you know the lay of the land and you've done it a couple of times, you can literally do this from start to finish in half an hour. Now, this is part of the attraction to both the Royal Enfield J Platform Series motorcycles and the 650 Twins. 
I get a lot of pushback in the comments on the various reviews that I've done of these bikes from so-called accomplished motorcyclists who don't want the short service intervals because it's going to cost them a fortune at the dealership having it serviced. Because to my mind, they're not motorcyclists, they're consumers. There are motorcycles for motorcyclists, of which this J-Series platform bike is one, so are the 650 Twins. And there are motorcyclists for consumers, that is, people who once they bought the motorcycle become a cash cow for the dealership, in that they must take it into the dealership for general routine servicing, because it's not possible, not really, to do it at home unless you're very well equipped and experienced. I speak to a lot of the old timers on this channel who had bikes back in the 50s and the 60s and literally adjusting the tappets was a job that they had to do on a weekly basis. They can't see what the problem is. But it's clear to see over the last 40 years or so that we have become vehicle consumers. We just buy the vehicle and then we throw it at a dealership because we don't know what to do when it comes to servicing. Hell, there are some people I know that even take the bikes into the dealership to have the tyres pumped up and the chains adjusted. Now, if you're the kind of person that wants to own this sort of motorcycle, but you can afford to take it into a dealership for everything, that's great. I've got no criticism for people like that. But if you can't afford to maintain a Royal Enfield at the dealership and you don't have the knowledge to do it yourself, it's probably a brand you should avoid. Although, I think the first time that you have your um, shim and bucket system checked and adjusted at a dealership, you'll probably change your mind. Right, so that's maintenance out of the way, or the major parts of the maintenance at least. What about general build quality? Actually, build quality is really good. It's, it's far better than the older Royal Enfields. Those days are long gone. Fit and finish is excellent, although in some places it is sort of a, a no frills approach to build. The components are high quality, they just don't spend lots of time and money polishing them and making them look pretty. They're quite workmanlike in some areas. Paint quality is on par with most manufacturers and I've not had any corrosion issues with any of my Royal Enfields including the old Classic 500. Any motorcycle, irrespective of who makes it or how much it costs, will rust if you use it, abuse it and don't take precautions to protect it. Enfields are no better and no worse than any other brand, mainstream brand that is, that you could care to mention. Reliability on all my Royal Enfields has been good. Okay, we had that glitch with the clock on this one, which I'm going to class as a one-off. And as I said, I went into the purchase of this bike with my eyes open. I was aware that that potential fault existed before I bought it. And I should make it clear really that that particular issue with the clocks is peculiar to the Classic 350. The Hunter and the Meteor are not affected. And finally, what about performance? You've only got to look at the Classic 350 to see that it was never designed to be a speed machine. This is a modern day version of the classic single cylinder 350 motorcycles that were popular in the 1950s and 60s. These were the mainstay of the economy. They represented the working man's entry into motorised transport. Practical, reliable or maybe they weren't back in those days. A machine that will get you to work Monday to Friday, rain or shine, take you and your girlfriend, if necessary, out on a weekend or in the evenings, and get you to the shops and back as necessary. They were even designed to double up as a touring machine for that two-week break that you got every year during the summer, so that you could take your favourite Doris to the coast for a couple of weeks or a dirty weekend. In short, they were designed to be a pleasurable, practical workhorse, and that's exactly what the Classic 350 is. 
I've got absolutely no doubt that it does it more comfortably and more reliably and in every other way much better than those machines of the 1950s and 60s. But it's those bikes that it was based on, the classic 350 single, and it fulfills all of those roles admirably. It's governed not to exceed sort of 73, 74 miles an hour. Yes, I know that there are single cylinder 125s that will do that for similar money, but it's not the same pleasurable experience. And the two cannot be compared. You have that big bike feel. You have that great guttural engine sound. Great handling characteristics and excellent straight line stability. It sips fuel at a rate of, well, just under 100 miles to the gallon. It turns heads wherever you go. You don't have to wring its neck. It does it in a way that leaves you feeling relaxed. And yes, if you hit a headwind, it can slow the bike down a little bit. But you just put up with that, or you could try changing gear. Yes, long, steep hills will slow the bike down. But again, that's what gearboxes are for. As I've said before, this is not a motorcycle for consumers. It's a motorcycle for motorcyclists. And don't forget, this bike is highly adaptable. There are loads of accessories from pannier systems to high windscreens that can help you fit this bike to your style of riding or overcome some issues that you personally have with it. The sky is the limit as far as pure adaptability is concerned. Am I glad I bought the Classic 350? Yes, I am. Like the Classic 500, this bike has got under my skin. I, I couldn't really part with it. It would take something very special to make me want to do that. It's a fun, easy to use, easy to ride, easy to park, light on the pocket motorcycle. And it's even more rewarding if you know what to do with a set of spanners. Right, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this and my other videos. I really do appreciate it. I would also appreciate it if you would leave a like and consider being a subscriber to this channel if you're not already a subscriber. It stimulates the algorithm here on YouTube and helps this channel out a lot. If you'd like to help in other words, you can sign up to my Patreon page or you could just leave a super thanks via the super thanks button down below. Either way, it's much appreciated. I will of course be back for the last time in 2023 on Friday with that horror story or spooky Christmas story. So until then, if you're riding, ride safely and I'll see you soon.